New violence in eastern Ukraine raising fears that the two-day-old ceasefire is on the verge of collapse. This as we get reports of heavy shelling overnight and this morning in Donetsk and the port city of Maripol, damaging homes and industrial facility and threatening a key airport, resulting in at least one death that we know of. Robert Hormatz is the author of The Price of Liberty, Paying for America's Wars. Also, he is former Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and Environment and former Goldman Sachs Vice Vice Chairman. He is now Vice Chairman of Kissinger Associates. Bob, it's always nice to have you on the program. Nice to be on your show again, Maria. Thank you so much for joining us. Shelling overnight, interrupting what was supposed to be a ceasefire. How do you characterize what's going on right now? Well, it's very uncertain what's going on. As you point out, Maripol is a very important strategic port, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if this ceasefire, which most people didn't really think was going to hold anyway, has broken down a little bit. I think there's a strong interest on the part of the Ukrainians in at least trying to stabilize things for the moment, but stability in this environment is very, very unlikely, and there are very few people who think this is going to lead to a permanent peace or permanent stability. It'll be pockmarked with a lot of volatility as this ceasefire is being implemented, if in fact it's implemented at all. And your view is that Putin will continue driving through West. I think Putin probably has gotten most of what he wanted. Pro-Russian forces are in control of the Donbass, which is very important from an economic and industrial point of view. He's pushed back against the Ukrainian army and other parts of eastern and southeastern Ukraine. He's gotten a lot of what he wanted, and he would like to have a sort of frozen war. If he can get a little bit more, he can. But basically, a lot of his interests have been achieved, and it will make Ukraine a weaker economy and a weaker political entity, and will give him a lot of influence over any outcome if there's a negotiation. Which is why he wants this so-called frozen war. He just wants yes. a frozen situation around him. Frozen war discredits Ukraine because the government really can't govern effectively. It's very hard to integrate more closely with the EU if you've lost about a third or a quarter of your your country and it also weakens the credibility of the West uh, this NATO summit which was very important to support the Balkans the Baltics and other countries really didn't do a lot for Ukraine uh, because essentially uh, he was given the signal before he wasn't going to get much and that made uh, Poroshenko move toward this uh, this uh, settlement or tentative settlement because he really couldn't get a lot more strategic support from the West. You are just back from Kazakhstan. You had meetings with a number of leaders in, in Europe. What is the mentality on the ground from European leaders to all of this? I think a lot of European leaders, including the former president of Poland who was there, who really know the area well, they all believe, first of all, that Russia has, Putin has imperial ambitions, not to reconstitute the old Soviet Union, but to push out the power and the influence of Russia to other parts of the region, and Ukraine, of course, is the primary candidate for that. They also think, and I've believed this for a period of time, sanctions have an adverse effect on the Russian economy. But the average Russian likes a strong leader, likes a strong Russia, and he's not going to, Putin's not going to give in on these issues just because the economy is adversely affected and will be for the foreseeable future. The only way it can really adversely affect the Russian economy in a, in a fundamental sense is if oil prices go down because that's half his budget. That would affect his ability to give all sorts of benefits to the Russian people, but oil prices have gone down, but not really enough to adversely affect him in a fundamental way. So why do you think that is? Why haven't oil prices? I mean, they've, they've been largely stable, despite what's happening not only in Russia and Ukraine, but also in, in the Middle East. Yes, for the most part, what's going on in the Middle East has not affected oil. The, the, the large amounts of Iraqi oil are in the south. They're not badly affected by what's going on. Libya can be a problem. If this Libyan deterioration continues, some of that Libyan oil might not get onto the market. So I think that's one part of, one part of the, the, the situation. Oil prices haven't gone down. I do think that haven't gone up. The, the thing that's very important, I think, is for the West, for the U.S. and the EU to get together and have an energy summit and figure out how we can both produce more energy in Europe and the U.S. and also cooperate to a greater degree as we did after the 73-74 uh, Middle Eastern War where there was a lot of solidarity. We can't have Russia think that Europe is vulnerable to energy pressure and enable him to use that 
to divide the U.S. from Western Europe. For sure. Um, I, I don't know why we haven't been doing that already, by the way. I mean, this seems obvious to me. Are, are there any surprises that you would expect as it relates to Russia, Ukraine, from the president's speech that we're expecting on Wednesday? The president, of course, is going to hopefully lay out a strategy against ISIS on Wednesday. But what about the Russia story? Do you think that comes up as well on Wednesday? I think it almost has to for a number of reasons. First of all, you've got to show credibility in dealing with Russia in Ukraine. And I think you need to do, in addition to what we're talking about and what's sort of foreshadowed by the NATO summit, there will be some additional support for Ukraine. That'll be helpful. A lot of additional support, credible support for countries in NATO that feel that they're vulnerable. But you also have to recognize that the energy area is something that they all feel vulnerable about. And we need to have that as a, a fundamental component in energy summit to figure out how to produce more energy around the world, particularly in the U.S. and Europe, and cooperate would be uh, substantial. We also shouldn't forget that Russia has a role in the Middle East. There are Russian airplanes in Iraq, and the president's talked about a coalition. Somehow, well, Russia won't be in any coalition um, that deals with ISIS, but there are Russian forces there on the ground in Iraq. So somehow, some conversation with the Russians is going to be is going to be needed on that. I don't think he'll talk about it, but it's certainly one of the background stories that, that's going on in the Middle East. There are a lot of players. We need to deal with the moderate Sunnis, like uh, the Jordanians and some of the others. But we also have to realize that there are other players. Iran's a player, Russia's a player, there are several others, and figure out how, at least in the background, they play into the situation. You can't ignore them, but you don't want them as necessarily overt allies. Right, either. right. It's a very good point, Bob. We so appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you for Bob having me. Bob Hormatz is vice chairman of Kissinger Associates with us today.